Michael López, alegría. Peggy Whitson, welcome to Longer Tables. Thank you, Jose. It's a pleasure to meet with you guys. It's, I mean, listen, I've been very lucky already to, to interview uh, cool people. But I think I've been looking at the stars and at the moon since I was a little boy. And yes, dreaming of, of going out there into space above Earth atmosphere. So you need to understand that for me to have both of you, obviously, Michael, who is a, a longtime friend of mine, and, and especially uh, you, uh, Commander Whitson, because should we always be calling you Commander? <laughs> Do people call you Commander when you are up there? I mean, come on, you've been almost two years of your life up there in a space, in the space station. You are the person that has been out of planet Earth for the longest. So you are the <laughs> coolest person anywhere. <laughs> well, we're typically not all that formal on board station. It's, it's a lot more casual, <laughs> luckily. Uh, okay, so I can call you Peggy. Yes, you may. All right. Oof. So, uh, I mean, uh, Michael, obviously I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Spaniard, but I know where I come from, but I'm an American. I know where I belong. You and I, you and I, we share that. You're Spanish, you're American. And I think we met. Didn't we meet the wrong food? Didn't we meet the wrong wine? Were you not like the ambassador of wines in Madrid at one point? I still am the ambassador of wines in Madrid. That's correct, yeah. A friend of mine, Antonio, is the... Um, the president of the Denominación de Origen Controlado de Vinos de Madrid. And uh, we did, uh, in fact, meet um, at some showing we had, I think, in Washington um, uh, quite a number of years ago. And for me, it was like the coolest thing, because it's like uh, here we have a, a, an astronaut who loves wine. And, and I don't think you ever cook uh, for me, but all our friends tell me you are one of the best the best cooks there can be. So are you the best astronaut cook ever in the history? I don't know. Peggy's eaten some of my food. I let her decide. I'm definitely so, not the best cook in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> because what is fascinating, too, is, is like uh, Peggy reading about you being uh, a young girl uh, living in a farm uh, in Iowa, in a farm with chickens and eggs. You... You were helping produce chickens and eggs because since you were little, you had the dream. You had the dream of, of flying, the dream of... The, tell us about it because you worked hard to become the commander and to become the astronaut that you are today. Yes, I, I actually dreamed of being an astronaut when the first guys walked on the moon. I was nine years old and I really uh, thought, wow, cool job. I'd love to be an astronaut. Of course, as a farm kid, you know, in rural Iowa, I had no idea how to go about that. Uh, but uh, when I graduated from high school was the first year they picked female astronauts at NASA. And, I, and among them was a, a couple of medical doctors and a biochemist. And I was very interested in biology and chemistry. So I thought, well, maybe I really can become an astronaut. And um, it, of course, it was a lot harder than than all that. It took me 10 years of applying before I was lucky enough to be selected, but it was been well worth it. So, so 10 years of applying, so for, for young boys and young girls out there that they look like to the start like you did, never give up. That's right, absolutely. And how many, how many times it took you, uh, Michael? Did you have to apply? I, I got in on my too? second time. I got in on my second try, so it's two years. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. He's a very talented guy. <laughs> He's a smart guy. In the kitchen, apparently. <laughs> He's a smart guy. So listen, um, for me, um, having you here, uh, it's so many other things that will have to do with technicalities about being out there, being in the shadow, being in the space station, all of the above. Uh, but if it's something I think is highly interested interesting for all of us uh, is really food because at the end it's cool to go to a space but still 
humans, we need to eat to keep uh, moving and to keep dreaming of going to new planets and one day new new systems. Uh, uh, who knows? So food very much is. Uh, tell me, tell me what you are. Uh, tell me what you eat. I'll tell you who you are. Food is essential. Uh, when you are up there in the space station, how how much time? It's not just to spend, obviously, eating, because I see you are busy doing space walks all the time. If I'm right, Peggy, you've been the person that has done the most space walks. Uh, you're... Female. You're the... LA's done as many as I have and spent a few more hours out there. Okay, so it's a friendly competition out there. <laughs> but how, how much time is of all of you who are astronauts, but you are researchers, you are so many things at once because you... You have to multiply. So between all your talents, you can cover all the needs of being in the space station or beyond. How much time is devoted to, to food, water, to how to grow, what, what foods we will eat? Because if we are really dreaming one day and getting to, to Mars or Jupiter and beyond, food is going to be essential and important in more ways than one. So how much of the things going on in both in a way food food growing etc etc i've done a few experiments where i was growing different types of cabbages uh looking at those and uh it was great fun because not only were we growing it for the science scientists on the ground to understand but they let us use every other harvest uh we could eat and it was so nice to have fresh food it, it's so important when you're eating out of a package, uh, you know, like meals ready to eat or uh, rehydrated food to have something fresh every now and then. And so I would make crab salad and put on our fresh lettuce. <laughs> you, you will make crab salad? Yes. <laughs> we, we had canned for crab and I would mix it with a little mayonnaise and <laughs> relish. And <laughs> I am talking to you from Maryland, and you know the logo here is crap. I think <laughs> the people of Maryland are uh, are are very happy. So, so all, you already been been part of the experiments used producing fresh food in the space station, but this brings some issues, like obviously gravity, which is an, a problem but an opportunity. But in gravity itself, what I read is that it's kind of difficult to. <clears throat> Uh, let me put it this way, the plants have a more difficult time used to bring the water down to the roots itself. So is this kind of the experiments you keep doing on researcher, researcher, Michael, so you keep bringing whatever is the experiment, whatever you learn, uh, back to Earth, and so all the different scientists can keep working in how to overcome all those challenges? Well, a lot of the experiments uh, with the plants have to have um, special containments for the roots. Normally, roots are attracted to gravity, and without gravity in space, they form a little ball. And you have to water those roots, but then they, the, lights, the light actually provides the growth for the plant, and it stimulates plant growth. Uh, in the opposite direction of the light. So it's, it's very interesting to try and grow high-producing products uh, in a very small space. So when we saw, Michael, uh, uh, that uh, fascinating movie on going to Mars, that, that astronaut uh, stuck behind, <laughs> and all of a sudden he had no food because everything exploded, and he created... Uh, a greenhouse in the surface of Mars and with poop and very creative ways was able to produce the water and got, and there he had potatoes and was eating potatoes and potatoes it was. Uh, something like that is something we will be able as humans to achieve well in the space station and well in one of the first colonies we'll do in Mars or, or the moon. Is that something that the movie really show us that this could be a way, or this was science fiction, Michael? Well, I mean, clearly there's a healthy amount of science fiction there, but I think the idea is that it showed, you know, the ingenuity that's necessary for human spaceflight. And I wasn't fortunate enough to participate in any of the food growing experiments on the ISS. For me, it was, it was literally just nutrition. And I have to say, that's something I missed the most, was 
not only preparing a meal but enjoying a freshly cooked meal because all of our food is prepackaged and basically it involves either just heating it up or squirting water into it. Um, but I think that it's a big challenge for us because when you think about a journey to Mars, at least with today's propulsion technology, it'll take six to eight months to get there, six to eight months to get back. And then because of the way the planets line up, so to speak, it takes a, you spend about six months there. So you're looking at a two-year mission. And that means unless we're able to grow something in situ, you're going to bring all that food with you for two years? I mean, can you imagine a logistical nightmare? I mean, Jose, with all of your restaurants, you know what food logistics must be like. Imagine going to deep space with that. So it's going to become, I think, more and more important for us to be able to understand how best to grow food, both in microgravity on the way to Mars and then using whatever kind of uh, resources we find there to grow in situ. So, Peggy, can you describe to, to, to many of us that, that we don't really know because we've not been there, but the challenges of use eating, of, of, of drinking, uh, the foods that you can take guys with you that, that they send, uh, that uh, when we go to the uh, na National, to the Air Museum, this, uh, right here in Washington, D.C., and everybody buys the the ice cream, the freeze dry ice cream, <laughs> that when you you buy it, you think it's very cool, and you think this is what the astronauts eat. But then, very much those ice cream bars, dry freeze, they are very crumbling, and you see all the crumbs all over. Uh, I don't want to be breaking the heart of any boy or girl that thought that they were eating uh, space food, but some of the challenges is that. Crumbly food is not something really you can take up there to space, correct? Peggy? No, no, that's correct. Absolutely. We don't have bread li largely for that reason, also being able to preserve it. So our favorite uh, bread-like product is tortillas because those preserve pretty well and they serve as our bread on board <laughs> the station. But uh, take... There's lots of considerations about eating food in space, and some of them are nutritional. You know, how do you maintain the vitamins and everything that the, the astronauts need, especially on long duration missions? Um, so those, there's lots of considerations. We need to make sure we don't have too much salt because that interferes with uh, your bones, and you actually will demineralize your bones more quickly if you have too much salt. So there's lots of nutritional considerations. In addition to the fact that, you know, people tend to get bored uh, with packaged food all the time. Uh, Michael, how, how, how is the drinking? When you want to drink uh, water, do you drink sodas in space? It's, uh, it's a sparkling water happening in space, or gravity doesn't make it happen? Yeah, we don't have any carbonated beverages in space except for the occasional experiment. I, I never tried it. Um, the water, we basically fill up what we call a drink bag, which is, uh, you may remember the old Capri Sun pouches, something very similar to that. It has a special straw that has a, a clamp that keeps it closed when, you're, when it's not in your mouth, um, and that's very important, especially with colored uh, drinks like fruit punch or a grape drink. If you're not careful, it becomes a little bit of a, like a machine gun and bubbles of, of a very bright liquid will start dotting the surfaces on the space station and, and that's not good. That's a, that's, a, that's a rookie mistake, as we would say. Um, but all how many, of the drinks, how many times How many times this has, uh, has happened in your presence? <laughs> well, that you've seen it typically, it. so we, both Peggy and I, have obviously done long duration missions um, and during those missions sometimes we'll have a visiting crew and it's ironic now because now Peggy and I are leading visiting crews but typically you'll see traces of that kind of thing after a visiting shuttle crew back in our day uh, leaves when you know somebody left a drink straw unclamped. Um, but it, it happens occasionally. It's not a big deal. You just have to clean it up, clean it up um, after them, and uh, it's part of housekeeping. Uh, so, yeah, when we see the Formula One uh, racing uh, drivers that they win, and the first thing is they splash the champagne. I guess that's equals. <laughs> but there is not a celebration because this can create a lot of problems to some of the equipment. Is that correct? Yeah, of course. I mean, you don't want to keep moisture away from anything. We do have a, 
On the Russian segment, we have a sort of like a water pistol, um, and you can be, you can, it's a little bit like a um, una bota, you know, where you take the wine and you tip it into your mouth and you take it farther and farther away. Huh. Um, but at some point, it becomes a little dicey, so you have to be very experienced. I wouldn't recommend that on a, on a visiting mission. <laughs> so, Peggy, you have then something called like a water vacuum? Uh, that if this happened, you go with a water vacuum and sh <laughs> you try to pick up every droplet out there? We do, we do have a wet dry vac, but usually it's just easier to take towels and, uh, and dry it up. And what we tend to do is uh, we let the towels air dry because we reclaim all that water uh, and clean it up and drink it again later. Okay, because uh, food, yes, we establish uh, uh, that will be amazing if you could produce for long-term missions to other planets and the old experiments uh, that they've been happening over the years will, will allow that you can bring your seats instead of your whole foods because they will occupy less space, but then you need to make sure those seats can become into plants that then can wear can, can bear fruit and, and other things. But without a doubt, water, water is something that <laughs> adds food essential for, for, for humans and more uh, in space. Uh, you dehydrate a lot when you are in space because the, the the zero gravity does the body the body lose more more moisture or or, or, or is the contrary? Uh, that's something I, I I never thought about about asking. So do we lose more water by being in the space or, or, or the water retains more? Well, it's definitely drier. We keep the humidity lower in space than, for instance, in Houston, Texas, <laughs> which is very humid. <laughs> but uh, so the air is drier. I think your skin has a tendency to dry out a little bit. Um, but we are reclaiming all that water now. Um, uh, NASA's reported they are reclaiming up to 97% of their water now, uh, which is great but that requires reclaiming it, including from urine. So we have a water processing urine, a urine processing unit and a water processing to clean it all up. And so as they, as they say, one day's coffee <laughs> becomes. <laughs> so uh, uh, all the people of longer tables, uh, uh, I know you got very bad uh, criticisms, but actually Many movies that they receive bad criticism is movies I love. And I remember Waterworld, uh, Kevin Costner. And at the very beginning of the movie, he's in the middle of water in a little boat. And you see him going through the process of peeing, which we all do, but reclaiming that and using a very quick way. That becomes water and it's clean. And he drinks it right there. I thought that the machine he used was not very believable. So the <laughs> machines that you use is highly so sophisticated, right? Yes, very much so. It, it takes up a large volume, but it, it really does make the water drinkable, and it's very clean. Um, can't taste the pee at all. <laughs> I mean, this will make the most interesting cocktail in the history. Yeah, the day that they, they will allow, you know, alcohol in the space or... So, that will be, yeah, give me a martini. What do you want, sir? Yeah, be here, and we'll give you the martini. That, that'll make it fun. Hi, highly interesting. Uh, do you want olives with it? <laughs> well, <laughs> but, but this is, is amazing. This only shows you something like what's in a movie, and we all thought was science fiction, that, that yes, humans, we are able to overcome those challenges and make them mm -hmm. uh, into um, fascinating uh, opportunities. When you are up there, Peggy, what is your, what is your favorite meal? Uh, I never get tired of chicken fajitas. That's my favorite one. <laughs> uh, fajitas, because the fajitas are, uh, and the tortilla is good because it, they yeah. don't crumble. So right. Fajita, right. fajitas and tortillas is something allowed. So the chicken fajitas, I mean, are you able to pick up uh, your menu when you go up there before you go? Are you able to pick up, <coughs> like when we take the plane, and some uh, big business, and they are able to ask you, you can choose vegetarian or chicken or beef. Are you able to choose every single meal when you go there? We have what they call a standard menu. So you have a selection among that standard menu, but then we have a special uh, 
preference uh, that you can pick all your favorites. Uh, so you have some extras just in case everybody else is eating all the chicken fajitas out of the, the standard menu uh, containers. <laughs> yeah, because there is no such a thing as Uber a space, Uber foods uh, a space. <laughs> and what is your... What is your favorite, Michael? What, uh, what, what is the one that you really love of, of all the things you eat up there? So this is going to sound a, a bit strange. My favorite one is actually a Russian-provided uh, food. It's, uh, it translates best into a cottage cheese with nuts. And it's, um, it's sort of a pudding, kind of a thick pudding texture. It's, it's obviously uh, curdled milk um, with walnuts in it. And it's a rehydratable. And when I was on board for my long mission, uh, it was pretty rare. I, we got one about one every 10 days. And this last time I was in space, the Russians were very generous with them, and they brought over enough to have one every day for breakfast. It was absolutely delicious. Cheese and nuts. Look at that. So that's yeah. one of your favorites. And, and, and what I want to know, uh, Peggy, what is something like after many, many days or weeks up there in the space station? that sometimes uh, when you are looking down at Earth and you say, oh man, I dream I could, I could eat this. Is any, any moment that you have something that you say, I wish I had, I had this in front of me right now? It's funny, after every flight I wanted something very different. After my first flight I wanted a steak. After my second flight I wanted a salad. After my third flight, I wanted pizza, so it, it really varied just depending on what, what was stuck in my brain that I, I wanted. <laughs> and so once you land and everything is okay and you are clear to go, that's what you do? You go and you drive to the first steak place or the first salad place or the first <laughs> yeah. pizza place? That's yeah, it, the way it works? Yeah, usually they'll bring it to you. They know they, that's what you want. They'll ask you what you want to have uh, when you get back to Earth. And what about you, Michael? What is the thing that sometimes you say, oh, man, I cannot wait to go back down and eat that? You know what? I, I miss more than eating anything, um, having a glass of wine or a cold beer for once in a while. I, you know, obviously, we're not uh, supposed to drink on the space station. And so those are the things. Obviously, the things that you can't have are the things you want most. And so I really missed having just a nice glass of wine with dinner. Um, it, it's to me it completes the meal and and i really missed having that on board are you sure the rush in the russian side they, they don't have bottles and bottles of vodka i mean russians are famous no, for that no comment on that <laughs> they certainly don't have wine i can tell you that <laughs> <laughs> okay 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 i don't want to get anyone in trouble that's great so so listen uh uh michael you gave you gave uh uh my team and I, the, the amazing honor and opportunity already uh, a few years ago that first I thought you were making fun of me <laughs> when, when now with your work uh, with Axiom and, and you gave me uh, the challenge of saying, hey, wouldn't be, wouldn't be great uh, maybe if you can, can make some food that, that we can bring with us on the new project of, of Axiom Space. And I already remember that during many years ago, I was talking to people on, on NASA, and precisely we were talking about making uh, some dishes and some menus. But I realized that the technicalities were many, that was great people doing amazing work, that the menu is endless, it's, it's so many dishes already that they've been created. And, and I felt that, well, this has already been done. And me, I like challenges that can be new. So you gave me this opportunity, and for me, obviously, it was yeah, used to be able to say that you've been part in working with amazing people, food experts, that they know very well now of the technicalities and the challenges of sending food to the space station and beyond. But you give me that opportunity. Already, I had already some experience. Uh, but there, I was very keen to say, okay, for me, it will be great, but if I can bring a dish that has a lot to do with, with who I am. And there we began working with all my team, led by Char Charis Dickens, a dear friend and a sensational chef in my team. And after two, three years, we were able to make paella. And we were able to bring this paella to the space station. And we were able to bring Iberico ham. 
and we were able to bring Spanish almonds. And all of a sudden, those things made it thank you for the amazing opportunity you gave me up to space. So now I can say, as a chef, as a cook, that I serve people like you up there. Uh, how was that paella? Delicious. So let me say, uh, just to fill out the picture, so we were um, allowed the opportunity to bring food with us that um, we would enjoy during the transit phase. So we launch on the SpaceX Crew Dragon. A day or so later, we get to the space station, and then on the way home, it's, it's about a day as well. And the challenge there is that we, we don't have any means to rehydrate or to heat the food. So everything had to be eaten at room temperature, at least the, the transit food. But we also prepared a meal, you prepared a meal, for us to share with our ISS crewmates. So when we got on board, we, had, we did have the facilities to be able to heat the meal and share with our Russian, American, and at, at that time German uh, colleagues up there. And they loved it. I can't tell you how excited they were. And we even had a little bit left over. And we asked, would it be OK if we left it on board? And uh, you couldn't see the smiles on their face told the story. So paella, flavor, 10 out of 10. The problem was it lacked a little bit of moisture. And that's a problem in space. And, and Peggy can attest to this. So when we opened the package, the individual grains of rice began flying out because it was enough moisture. The moisture with surface tension will hold things together. You can eat, you can eat soup on board because it will form a, a ball or a bubble inside the container. And if you eat anything moist, it'll stay well behaved. But the minute it gets to be a bit too dry and the, and the rice grains can separate, it becomes kind of a sport. So you can imagine in our first uh, time we opened this, which is in transit, so my crewmates had been in space for a total of maybe six hours in their entire life. And eating, just being able to sit still is challenging in microgravity. So opening something and having things start flying out, I mean, we look like fish chasing down the individual grains of rice. So as I said, from a flavor standpoint, it couldn't have been better. It should probably have had a little bit more moisture to, uh, to be eatable, or, or I should say edible, in, at least in a dignified way in space. So flavor-wise, we got to 10. Uh, practicality and success of mission, we got close to uh, zero. Uh, which uh, very no, interesting. That means we need to be sending stuff. chopsticks next time, so <laughs> you can grain by grain. I mean, is, you know how many hundreds and hundreds of pieces of rice, of grains of rice, are in a portion. Uh, so I do. I do. Be picking <laughs> 300, 500 grains. That will be that will be great for sports. Uh, but, oh, my God, and you will have to keep a count. We'll have to do in the space station a rice grain Sport count. Work. No, but now I don't want to make fun of it. This only shows you, and that's why I always appreciate the, the difficulty and the amazing work that so many have put behind in making yes, sure that, that food is not something like put the mission in danger. Yeah, and Jose, so and, and you have to... We learn with that, even we were having the best people working with us that don't know. But here we were trying to make the most appetizing possible dish without becoming mushy or... And there was the challenges that, yeah. at the end, the issue, and that's why those missions you do are so important, that nothing can go wrong, because anything can put in jeopardy not only the mission, but in a way, even the lives of the men and women, not only in the space station, but just the day we go back to the moon or the way we will go back to Mars. So I know I will... I will be having the opportunity to do it again, and we keep working and working until all the dishes are by perfect. Because the question I'm going to ask you, uh, Peggy uh, uh, and Michael, uh, very often many people will question, not very often, but sometimes you will read it on the internet or in the newspaper, or, and they say, which will be logical, why are we spending so much money and effort and time and billions and billions and billions of dollars? to send men and women to a space station and to do experiments, um, even so something so simple as trying, but then so challenging and difficult, like making food that is right for gravity zero and that has nutrients and that doesn't create problems. Uh, um, 
and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But very often people will challenge that. Why are we in a space when it's hunger, when it's poverty, when right now we have real issues on planet Earth? Um, oh. why, what is your take on that? Well, I, I uh, honestly believe that the technologies that we develop to solve these complex problems are things that we can use here on Earth. Things like, you know, recycling urine and uh, cleaning up water. Uh, it's, it's a really uh, important technology to have when you have areas that have been flooded and people don't have clean drinking water. So all of this technology, I think, uh, improves our standard of living and is important here on Earth. Uh, also, that I'm as a scientist, I believe that the research benefits, particularly as we begin doing more and more real manufacturing in space, uh, will have direct benefits. For instance, like uh, pharmaceuticals, the drugs that we can develop in space that. Uh, we can't do as easily or as as uh, readily here on the ground. So I I feel there are lots of benefits of going into space, and um, uh, I I'm always excited to share, you know, the different technologies that we are developing as we go into space. Uh, I think they end up being applicable here in everyday life. You know, all the technologies you have on your cell phone for GPS and and all your com you know communications technology all of that comes from exploration of space uh michael you you don't i don't know if i i told you but thanks to the opportunity you gave us to challenge ourselves to bring a dish like paella uh going up uh and then some paella that was shared there uh, with the astronauts the same technology simple but not so simple as you see the failure of having grains floating, but the same technology allow us during the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the conflict, which I've been there very often, we had the challenge that we had to be feeding men and women, many of them elderly, near the front lines that they couldn't move. And we found a factory in Ukraine, in Kiev, that was closed, but applied the same technology to beat to make the meals that they did and had to be refrigerated and will last forever. That same opportunity you gave us to work and learn gave us the know-how to also feed people because of war, because of conflict, in the front lines where Ukrainians are defending their land from the Russian invasion. So this goes with what you said, Peggy. It's more ways than one that humanity is and will benefit from all the efforts and experiments and learning that people like you are are doing every time you go up there. So, uh, Michael, how was the ham? The rice I know, but the ham was good. Spectacular. The, the good. fat, the, the the fat of the ham didn't go all over no, no, I the mean, space it, station. We just the, had the, to. We had to uh, wash our our hands very well afterward with, uh, with a wet wipe because it was uh, fairly greasy. As you know, that's sort of a prize. Oh, my uh, God, another, another failure. Now we said no, no, greasy. No, positive. <laughs> so Listen. we kept you busy. We, I mean, what you are telling me that you never worked so hard, this is, this is the equivalent to washing dishes after Thanksgiving. You were picking up the grains, the pieces of grain everywhere. And now you had to be cleaning your hands and your fingers. So you were licking non-stop. Like. Exactly. Which is a which desired is outcome, right? <laughs> I, Jose, I think it's really important to know that when you're eating food out of pouches, one of the things that I miss so much is aroma. And I, you forget how much aroma is involved in taste uh, sometimes. And I just really... Uh, you know, miss that having those aromas as part of the cooking. One of the things we did was uh, we we got fresh garlic on board and we added it. We took a drink bag and cut the end off and stuffed in the garlic cloves and and uh, some olive oil and a little salt and pepper and heated it up. And then all afternoon, the oven, the whole space station would smell like. Uh, garlic cloves and it, it was so enjoyable you was like I'm hungry I, I really want to eat because I smell something cooking 
You, do you imagine an, uh, an alien civilization will find where we are because of the smell of garlic? <laughs> no. <laughs> like, like how, how Earth was discovered by those, those new Earthlings because they smell garlic millions of years, solar lights away from them. But it would be interesting. If they uh, garlic, the garlic what, brought, what, what brought different civilizations together. <laughs> so, uh, you mentioned something very important. Uh, I didn't ask you at the beginning, but we were talking about eating food that, if it's crumbly, is not good. Uh, food that is no, has the right moist, like the paella that was ready to eat. Uh, the grains used float away. Blah blah. The many, uh, 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 many, uh, uh, and, and many, uh, and many issues. But you you mentioned about one thing is flavor. Flavor, our tongue. Is what gives us the flavor. Quite frankly, even the tongue is beautiful and has all these receptacles that is able to get the acids and the salties and the sweets and the bitters. But what really, really gives us love for food is our nose. With the nose, we get tens and tens of thousands of compounds. That is really what makes us love food more than the pure flavor that our tongue is able. Is is the nose. So. One to hundred percent. How much nose perception you you feel you lose when you are in gravity zero? Hmm. It's it, it's ninety percent. It's fifty percent. It's ten percent. How much you really are able to smell? You said the garlic was everywhere, but do you what do you lose most? The sense of taste in the tongue or the sense of smell in the nose? I think the food is, and because it's packaged, you don't have the sense of it cooking or baking. So you only have a sense of smell once you open the package up. Uh, and I think it's limited somehow. I don't know if it's the decreased sensitivity of the nose. People say, you know, some things don't taste the same in orbit. For me, I love the shrimp cocktail on the ground, the rehydrated shrimp cocktail on the ground, but I never liked it in space. Um, so they think sometimes tastes change a little bit. Um, I don't know if L.A. had any of those experiences uh, where he preferred something different in space. So, Michael, should we bring, uh, let's say, roasted chicken spray bottle aroma perfume that when you open the couch, the pouch, you use it? Because if you say that would be great because you're... Your, your senses are going to be happier. And if your senses are happier, you're happier. You are there weeks and months. You want to be happy all the time because you are under very difficult, stressful situation. Ca can we bring perfumes with the smell and aromas of the dish you are about to eat? Like, like the garlic Peggy mentioned before. You know, Jose, you mentioned how hard your team had to work in order to get the food, I'll say, certified to go on the, to the space station. And... As you know, all the microbial testing, not to mention the nutritional things, I mean, it's a very long and difficult process. So I think the answer to your question is probably we could get a smell up there. I'm not sure that would be positive for morale because then the smell would be probably better than the food <laughs> and that would just make us more angry. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we need to open a restaurant in the, in the wing in the space station. That's what we have to do. So start making room for me. <laughs> yeah, you got it. I, I really think, and, and Peggy likes to cook as well, for those of us that like to cook, that's, that's really what we miss, the ability to, you know, make some small adjustments. We eat, the chicken fajitas are good, but they are exactly the same every single time you have them. And the menu repeats such that you're probably eating that at least once a week, if not more often. And I think the ability to, you know, stand next to a stove and actually experiment and try things and feel the reaction uh, as we talked about the odors, that's something that's um, from a morale standpoint, and everybody has something that they like to do in their spare time. But for those that like cooking, you're out of luck on the space station. There's not much you can do beside the garlic and the olive oil trick that Peggy mentioned. Okay. So now... Every day, more and more, we keep listening uh, like this could one day be a reality of, of maybe one day really having uh, a mission in the moon one day or in Mars with men living there. 
man and woman living there nonstop with a real, a real base. And I don't know if you read the news, but the other day, uh, Peggy, Michael, uh, the FDA in America gave uh, finally green light for a protein, a meat, a chicken, that now is going to be made like in a fermenting bat, in a, like if you were making beer, but happens you're making and creating chicken cells. And I believe something like this maybe one day will be happening in the surface of the moon if we have people living there or in the surface of Mars. So there is also very amazing new technology that we are developing to produce chicken meat without raising chickens and to produce burgers without raising beef and cattle. Uh, we are going to need uh, new technology like this if one day we want to have a foot in the surface of the moon or in Mars for longer term. Because I don't see that we're going to be having uh, cows and porks and chickens, Peggy, like if you were in Iowa, uh, flying in gravity zero around the surface of the moon. So those technologies that are happening every day, do you see them that is the way we will be able to be producing those proteins in a possible base in Mars or in the I mean, you tell me, Jose, you, you, I know that you're one of the very few that were licensed to use this, um, this new product, which is basically grown from cells, right? And well, yep. how does it taste? How does it, amazing. how is the texture? I'm part of the team, so uh, 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 amazing, but what I, I believe is, is seeing the things you guys have been doing all these years, testing and retesting and, 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 and producing water out of urine and, I think this is going to be uh, the way. So I cannot wait to see one day that we will be able to produce that. And, and maybe one day I get, uh, uh, again, the opportunity that then we can bring this meat up to the space station, or even better, one day when. Wouldn't be great just to have a little base like we have in the north and the south pole, but in the surface of the moon? Mm -hmm. Do you think, Peggy, we will see this in our, in our lifetimes? We're, is this something that can be happening in the next 10, 20 years? Uh, maybe a bit more than that, but I would love to see it. I would. So I, I see you there, Peggy, used with your chicken farm, uh, because <laughs> that's how you began. That's how you help raise the money to pay your dream of one day being, you know, a pilot and then an astronaut. And yeah, this will be great. Peggy with some chickens on the surface of the moon. <laughs> and, and, Ma and Michael Alegrea used with his wine from wine made in Mars, local <laughs> wine for the Earthlings coming to visit us. Well, uh, I know we are making, uh, I'm making fun of this, but I only want to uh, show not only my appreciation, but I think everybody here uh, that when sometimes we see uh, in my phone, uh, my wife sometimes is always awakened because it's an alarm that always goes on. And it's not the alarm for my wake up time or because I left something in the oven. It's the alarm that tells me that the space station is somewhere above me and is about to do a pass. And one of the things all the time I do, that's a matter where I am. I go out and I try to find in what direction it's coming and is that 30 seconds to two minutes and a half, three minutes that I can see it. And when the sun, somewhere from behind the Earth is able to hit the space station and you see it like a fascinating, glowing star. I know it's people like you up there and gives me a lot of joy and appreciation of, of the risk you take, how you're helping advance uh, uh, humanity in ways we don't even uh, realize, but always gives me joy and a big smile when when I see the space station over my head and know that, that Peggy or Michael are up there working to move the dreams of humanity forward. So thank you very much, Peggy. Thank you very much, Michael. And I promise the next paella, you will not have to be catching up grain by grain. <laughs> or we will change the name of the recipe, 500 paella grain. Please eat it at your own risk.